Another note on homework related things is that I'm moving my office hours again this week to Wednesday because I will be at a conference Thursday and Friday, so it's on the Google map so you guys can see that. That is always the most up to date. We don't obviously change the website when it's a one time change. So you can see there that today I'm giving lecture office hours this week on Wednesday at 2, so it's going to segue right after Crown Ops office hours, so we'll pretty much have four straight hours of office hours, so hopefully that will be helpful. Okay, so as Alex has mentioned before, whenever you're talking about maps, we want to start off right off the bat with the caveat that maps are overused. Okay, they, well, they can be overused, and, and you have to use them carefully because you lose one of the strongest ways of encoding data, which is position. When you're encoding data on a map, you lose that. The position of your data has to go according to the latitude and longitude, and you can change your projection of these things, but you no longer can use X and Y axes to determine or to encode another attribute as position. So, so you're making sure that when you use a map that it is the most appropriate way to use that. And we're going to talk about two different maps and examples of when you should use one or the other. So when we talk about maps, you pretty much have data maps or street maps with data on them. Street maps, I'm sure everyone knows, are Google Maps, right? So when do we use each one? Data maps is when you want to give um, an abstract representation of your data on top of a, on to, on, uh, sorry, a representation of your data on top of an abstract map. And I have quite a few, but I thought were pretty cool examples here to show you guys. Um, some of these examples use Flash, and Alex just showed me today that not everyone has Flash enabled on their 
um, browser, depending on what you're using, it looks like the latest version of Chrome doesn't support it. So my computer does, because when I was putting these together, but if you, when you click on these, don't see it, that's why. It's because you don't have Flash. So this is the first one. This is, and all of them are from the New York Times, because they make the coolest maps. Um, so this is one that shows Netflix queues by region. Right, and so you can navigate in all different kinds of ways. You can go to Boston, which is particularly my favorite place, and you can it pretty much tells you um, what are the highest ranked movies. So Yes Man apparently is the highest ranked movie, or the most oftenly queued movie on Netflix for Boston. You can go to Chicago, Washington, and so forth. So as you can see, the idea here is to show something such like uh, abstract data. So in this case, we're looking at. Um, Sorry, abstract map. In this case, we get Netflix queues, and we use the position, but we're not really going to navigate to a certain street. You don't really care what the address is. This is just a basic reference of where in the world this data lives. This one is what America, what music Americans uh, love the most, and then there's fan maps for each one. Um, the one that I wanted to show you is where. Justin Bieber is the most popular, which is that one. Um, you know, these are cool maps to look at, um, but again, you don't really need any kind of specific information. You're not navigating, you're not zooming into a certain country. This is just to give you a geo, a sense of geolocation for your data. Let's see if there's the last one. There are a few. You guys can click on those, but the one I thought was pretty cool is this one, which is where do bars outnumber grocery stores? And so the color scale goes from the more bars you have, the more brown it is, and the, and the more grocery stores you have, the more green it is, and white means they're pretty much even. So that's pretty cool to see, and you can see that you know, the general region of Wisconsin has 2.7 times more bars than it has grocery stores. So that's interesting. But the cool thing is if you keep scrolling and you look at other countries, there's Poland has 548% more grocery stores than bars. That's, that's a lot. France has a lot of bars, Spain has a lot of bars. Anyway, it's pretty cool. I was scrolling through this for, for a bit. Anyway, just examples of when you want to use data maps. Yes. Yeah, there we go. So the second kind of map is street maps, and as we, we I just mentioned, it's when you want to use Google Maps, right? And so this is obviously very relevant when you want to look at, for example, Yelp reviews. You care about where that restaurant is. So even if you're visualizing, let's suppose you were visualizing Yelp reviews as little star icons and you used color to encode five stars with red, it was blue, and then one star was red. Anyway, so you still encode your data on top of it, but you still need the actual lat long and the browsability of a Google map or something like that to actually find the address and so forth. And so that's a different kind. We're going to cover both kinds today, but your homework um, and hopefully this is not going to surprise to you, is a data map. So when we're talking about data maps, we obviously have to take a step back to think about what kind of data are we dealing with. And geospatial data on the web is usually a geojson or a topojson. Okay, and I'm going to talk about the differences between the two, and in your homework you're dealing with a topojson that needs to be converted to a geojson. So the geojson format pretty much is describes geography, right? And it's, a, it's a one or more yeah. lot long so it's pretty intuitive in terms of, I mean, it's a pretty straightforward explanation, but I want to show you what the format of different GeoJSON objects are, because not only are you going to handle them in your homework, but, you know, if, if you look at so many of the blocks that use the, the maps, they have US states.json, countries.json, they can be in slightly different formats. So if you get your code for the homework and you decide to go out and use an example from a block and try to use that data, it's going to be in a little bit of a different format, so we can kind of understand what the differences are. So the most simple GeoJSON object you're ever going to encounter is a point. So very unexciting. You, know, you pretty much just have the type it is a point and an array of two coordinates. A multipoint is one step beyond that, where you can have more than one point. So now it is an array of points. And this does get interesting, I promise you. So with the line string, you now have points that are connected. And if you put these coordinates on a map, they actually connect to form a line. The multi-line string has several disconnected lines. So those can be used to form, for example, if you were doing um, every state is a, is a line, and you're not necessarily doing contiguous states, then you would use a multi-line string. You have a polygon, which is an array, of, an array of arrays of positioning that form a polygon, and they may have holes in it. And in here, because as you can imagine, these were getting pretty long, the dot, dot, dot just means more of the same. 
um, you can have a multi-polygon, you can have a collection of any of the things I've shown you so far, which is called a geometry collection. Then inside that you'll have the type, so for example, if you have a polygon and a point together, it's called a geometry collection. And then the two that I want to pay the most attention to here, which is what you're going to encounter in your homework, are features. Okay? So a feature is very similar to a polygon, but it has this extra thing, which are properties. So you can pretty much add labels to it. So as you can imagine, when we're working with files that have, for example, all the states in the US or all the countries, in your homework it's countries and this examples are states, we not only want a list of Latin longs, we also want to know what state are we talking about. And then as you can imagine, you can go from something as simple as having a name to something as complex as actually adding in the mean income for a state or favorite music for a state. And you can manipulate your data and insert all of that in as properties. A feature collection is an array of feature objects. So if you have a single feature object for a single state and you want a collection of all the US states, you're going to put them all together into a feature collection. Okay. So that, those are pretty much the formats that you can encounter GeoJSON data in. There is a superset of technically, I guess, a superset, but it's an extension. It's an extension of the GeoJSON format is a topoJSON format. And the main purpose of this is to optimize information. So if you can imagine, imagine you're drawing out all 50 states. There are a lot of common boundaries there, right? So you're pretty much encoding the same Latin long twice. And if it's a few states, that's fine, but as it gets bigger and bigger, the entire world, let's suppose you're encoding all of the counties in the entire world. That file gets really big because every time that there is a new boundary that encodes the same space, but now for the county on the left and on the right, you have these duplicates. So this format, TopoJSON, eliminates that by re-encoding it as one continuous line. It only lifts up the pen when it has to. And so obviously this is not as intuitive for you looking at that data because you no longer have this neat little separation of this is Alabama, and these are the Latin longs of Alabama, this is whatever the state that's next to Alabama, and so forth and so on, right? It's just one line. So the big advantage of having this, obviously, is the file is up to 80% smaller. So you have a much smaller compact representation of the same data. And as you know, when you're transmitting data over the web, the smaller the better. So, so it's 80% smaller. It uses these shared line segments, which are called arcs. And then I just wanted to show you, because you will be looking at this data in your homework, when you load in, before you do any transformation from topo to geo, and you do a console.log, what it looks like. Okay? So the concept is you have an object of type topology, and you may have a transformation on it. And then inside it, you have the arcs, which is what I just said was, were these shared segments, which you don't really care about. This is just a behind, under the hood kind of thing. And then you have an object array. In this case, you just have one, which are the countries. And then inside these countries, you have the geometries. And actually, I don't really know what the CRS is. But what you really care about is geometries. And then inside there, you have all of your dots. What we want is to take this topology file, and we want to make it into a GeoJSON file, because that's what D3 is going to use, because D3 is going to draw a separate path for each one of our states or countries, in the case of your homework. So this is what it looks like in the console when you, when you read it in. If you were to open it up in an editor, just so you can kind of, actually it's the same data, it's just it's a little bit more opened up, a little bit more expanded, you see that the type is topology, we have a transformer applied on it, so you have a scale, you can have a translate, these are just things applied to the entire object. And then here you have an array of objects. In this case, it's a geometry collection of US states. So hopefully now the, the shape of these two types, of formats of data is familiar to you, and you understand which are. And what we really need to do now is convert from one to the other. And luckily, D3 has a library for it called TopoJSON. So this is the <coughs> script that you would use to include that library. And this is the part that I want you guys to pay attention to the whole lecture, obviously, but specifically this, as far as this is where people got really stuck in the homework last time. So we're really breaking it down to make it clear. So the library has the feature that you want to use is called topojson.feature. And the idea behind that is you want to take an object, a topo object, and make it into a geojson feature, which is one of those two that I highlighted when we were talking earlier about geojson objects. And the way that it works is it takes your whole topology object as your first argument here, and the second one is the specific object within it, because like I said, it can have an array of objects that you're interested in converting. Okay? So you have everything in the first argument, and just the thing that you are going to use as your path in your D3 visualization as a second object. Right? So to break it down even further, let's suppose that we had, so this is the call, 
So here we have topoJSON.feature. If you're reading in a JSON file, the whole object goes straight into that first argument. And the second one is this one right here, which hopefully is not completely foreign, given the fact that we were just looking at what it looks like in the console. So we're pretty much narrowing down which one of the several objects this topoJSON file has that we want to convert to a GeoJSON. Okay? And what that outputs for you is a feature collection, which is very much the format that we are comfortable with, and D3 is comfortable with using, and what we're going to use both in these examples and in the homework. Now I'm going to give you guys 10 seconds to think about that, and if there are any questions, now would be a great time to ask. About two seconds. What's up? Um, can you go over why exactly are you pointing to just countries in the topo object? Yes. So if you remember, one of the things that topo.json does is it makes a really big file really small. So let's suppose you have a topo.json in the entire world, and you're really <coughs> interested in plotting Brazil. If you were to unpack that entire topo.json object just to grab Brazil, you're pretty much undoing the work of compacting it in the first place, and now you have all of the paths for every country in the world. So this library allows you to say, I'm only interested in this part of it. So because in this case we only have countries in there, it seems kind of like redundant to re-specify it. Yeah. But you can have an array of objects, you know, countries, and maybe you have another level of counties or whatever it is, so you get to pick out of this one topo.json file what it is that's of interest to you. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Why doesn't D3 work with topo.json? <laughs> I think that's um, does. Topo.json is actually developed on Mac Plastic. Um, so it's the same, like it's just a separate piece and um, you want to generate a, um, a path, like what, what GeoJSON does or what D3 does, it takes a GeoJSON path and converts it into um, a, a path element, an SVG path element. And so this intermediate step would be necessary anyway. So this is just like topo JSON. This, this call here um, is just um, kind of like a function that you need to call and it could be part of D3 but just separate concerns because you could use it in other situations too. It's not part of D3 core. Okay. okay, so we're comfortable with the data, right? And, and we're going to start looking at how can we now use this to make our abstract data map where we're going to plot our favorite music or whatever it is that we want. So if we go back to now we have a GeoJSON file, right? We have it in the format that we want. And I want to take a closer look at what exactly the information is here. So we have a feature collection, and each feature in this case is a state, right? So we have a type, in this case there's an ID, um, properties is just a name, and then we have the actual information that we want, which is the geometry of the polygon and the coordinates. Uh, can someone tell me, just looking at this, what these coordinates are? Are they pixel values, or are they lattice and longitude values? I'm just going to scroll down where the answer is. What would you guess? Lattice longitude. They're lattice and longitude, exactly. So these are geographic information, right? And as you can imagine, just like we've done so far where we map data to pixels, we now want to map latitude and longitude to pixels. Now, if you were just to use the skills that you have acquired so far in this class, how would you do that? Scale. You would do a scale, exactly. However, latitude and longitude refers to a sphere, right? So if you do a linear scale, it looks distorted and doesn't look right. And so this is where we come into using projections, right? So projection is a type of scale. It just takes into account the fact that we're going from a sphere to a flat plane. And as you can imagine, there are a myriad of selections and things you can do in different scales you can pick. So we're kind of going to go into how do we use projections to take these latitude and longitude values and put them on the screen in a way that they look like a non-distorted map, or distorted if you pick a projection that, and that's what you want to, that's what you want to show. Okay, so here we have the latitude and longitude. Um, and I want to use a projection to transform it into pixels, and so the way we're doing this is we're doing a code snippet. Now, for this class, we're going to be doing a lot of playing around with it, so for those of you who want to actually do that on your console as well, either now or later, I highly recommend that. Even as I was putting together this lecture, I figured out a few things just by poking around and using projections I hadn't either, so it's really a nice way of getting comfortable with the syntax that you will use in your homework. So here we have, and this is a super contrived and simple example, right? We have a data point that just has a latitude and longitude value, very similar to the ones that we would get in our GeoJSON file. And then we have, D3 has a selection of projections that we're going to look at in a little bit, the, um, 
Mike Bostock put a really cool way of transitioning between them that you can see. But the point here is you have a projection, and you say, and this is the choice. You chose this Geo Albers USA, you save it in projection. This is the scaling. This is the equivalent of us saying, here's our X scale, here's your data, give me your pixels. Now we're giving it a latitude and a longitude and giving us an output. Now one thing that people get kind of stuck here is that unlike scales, you give it two inputs and it looks like you get one output. Right? Anyone have an idea what's going on there? Well, you're giving it one array. So I'm guessing you're getting out one way. Yes, exactly. And so knowing that when you're going to be positioning your, and you have to access the index 0 and 1, just to be, I mean, it may seem painfully obvious for a lot of people, but one of the nice things about this being the third year that we're giving the class is we know that this is the part where sometimes people don't really get it. So if we were to do, and, and we might have a, yeah, a little bit of a, So we have our original positions, right, which is an object of Latin long, and our projected positions, which are the pixel values, 662 and 237. So pretty straightforward, but I, what I really want you to understand here, projections, they're nothing more than a scale. And you give it both the latitude and the longitude at the same time, and you get both the projected latitude and longitude back. Okay? Now, as you can imagine, there are, as anyone who's ever worked with maps or knows that there are so many different possible projections and you can get lost in this. So what we wanted to show you here was, I think this, yeah, this pretty much just animates between every single possible projection. And you can get to some pretty funky ones. Um, we use a pretty boring one in the homework, but if you wanted to just play around with it, it's pretty cool. So it depends on the name of the projection we are using, like Geo Alaska. Yes, exactly. The D3 dot, and then the name. And if you want to see what that looks like, you can actually come here and just pick whichever one you want. So it's a different function gives you a different, right? So unlike scales, where with scales, you would, the linear scale applies to any set of inputs and outputs. You just define it. In this case, no. It's one different function per projection. Because behind the scenes, they do different things. OK. So now you have your pixel values, right? And what you want to do is you want to convert that into a path. And at this point, I'm sure it's pretty, well, hopefully not surprising to anyone that we use the path, just we have line elements, we have rectangle elements, we have circle elements, we have these basic SPC shapes, but the moment that you start drawing anything that doesn't look like a line, a rectangle, or a circle, we use a path, right? And so we have this path generator. D3.line is a path generator that returns a very boring line. So we D3.geopath takes in these pixel values and returns a path for, well, whatever you're giving it. In this case, we're giving it countries or states and so forth. So we're going to step through an example, and, um, and we're going to start off with a simple example, and then we're going to add components on top of it. But this is we're going to take this as, as slow as possible to make sure that everyone understands what's going on here. Okay, so we have the CSS styling up top, and we'll see where that applies to in a minute. Here we've already included the SVG inside the body, so we're not appending it with our JavaScript. We just have a placeholder, right? And then we have a map layer. Or we don't actually use the city layer just yet. So we select the SVG. Can someone tell me what is going on in this line right here? What is that returning? It's an integer value. What number is it based on what you see on the screen right now? Yes. So you know how we use D3 selection that attribute to set an attribute? Overwhelming yes, of course. This is natural. This is not even a question. 
we can use svg.attribute without the second input to get it back. Okay? So if you have something and maybe you want to scale something as a function of something else, you don't have to keep track of that. You can use the same syntax to grab that attribute by simply not giving it a second parameter. And it defaults to, oh, you want to know what that attribute is instead of setting it. This is a cool thing to know. It's something that isn't surprising. Yeah, go ahead. Um, do you have to use parse in it because it would return like a string value? or? I think, does it default to a string value or would just being safe? Uh, it, well, you don't actually have to parse in that just to the plus. Yeah, no, right, but, but you don't really know. I guess if you know that your width is a number, but I'm not actually sure if it defaults to a number. But that's a good question. So like you said, just another thing, sometimes if you just do the plus, that's a shorthand for the mm -hmm. same thing. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to use the projection that we were just talking about. So here we're creating our projection, d3.joarbers.usa, and you can add a few more things. So in this case, we're translating it and we're scaling it. And the best way of understanding what this does is to play around with the numbers. But as you can imagine, translating it moves it from the right to the left, or top bottom, and scale makes it bigger or smaller. So just for fun, if we, so first of all, let's just scroll down and see what it looks like right now, right? So this is what it looks like. Um, let us... Take out the translate. Don't move it very much. But it's no longer right in the middle, right? It translated by, uh, before we were translating it by the width divided by two. What if we scale it by 100? Okay, so the projection does more. So now we have this scale, which are projection, and not only does it translate from our large and large pixel values, but it can do other scale-like things. Move it around, make it bigger and smaller. Okay. So can I explain that the translate function, what it does is width by divided by two and height divided by two, we will get some values and does it... So it moved it over by the amount by the width of your SVG divided by two. So that's the amount. And we, we got the width in the line above it from yeah, that's that right there. Yeah. Height divided by two and width divided by two. So it's the center. Yes, the cent to, to center it on your, in your SVG. Okay. Now this line combines two things that we've talked about and that it's kind of important to understand what's going on here, right? So here we have, so if you just look at d3.geopath, it's a path generator. And as a path generator, it also takes in the potential of a projection. So here we're binding, in a sense, we're joining the path generator with the projection that we just made, and we're putting that into path, right? And path is what we're going to use to define our D attribute, which is what we've done so far with lines. If you were creating a line, and we remember we, we, drew, we made that line generator for the last homework, and you passed it in as the attribute for D, we're creating a slightly fancier, instead of a line generator, it's a fancy path generator that will also take in a projection, okay? And then here, this is all very familiar D3 code at this point, right? So we are loading in a JSON file. Um, we're selecting the layer that we wanna put our base map on. We're selecting a path. We're adding in JSON.features as a data. Enter, append, and attribute the path. Um, as you can see, this is a super, super simple example because what we're focusing here on is this concept of creating, using projections to draw geographic data. But as I'm sure anyone who's successfully completed homework three knows, we have to be careful with doing this all in one go with the enter and the append and the styling, right? Because the moment we update this, so let's suppose we were updating this, like for example, in the, in the reel that we just showed you where it changes projection, you would have to actually have a separate update statement because otherwise you wouldn't do anything other than modify the enter selection. Right? Um, okay, and then the other thing, even though it looks really ugly, which is why it's commented out, I wanted to show you because we do ask you to add this on the homework. Um, a lot of maps, most maps, not so much when it's this small a scale, but if you think of a world map, you, uh, you usually have those lines that delineate the different longitudes, and sometimes the different longitudes, that's called a graticule, and we want you to add that because your homework has a whole world map in it, so we wanted to show you how to do that. So I'm going to unselect these two, and it's really ugly for the, just the country, which is why I unselected it. But the concept being, just like there are different path generators, GeoGraticule is a path generator for these lines. Okay, so the syntax is actually fairly simple. 
you assign it to Graticule, you select your map layer, you append a path, you give it the data. Here we're going to call it, that we gave it the class of Gract. We use that same path generator from here. Can someone tell me why this path is inside this call? If you're drawing your latitude and longitude lines, you need to know where to draw them, right? And it's going to depend on your projection, right? So the idea here is we're still using the same path generator, we're just giving it different data. Because if you think about it, all the points that are on this map, they have to abide by the same projection, otherwise it wouldn't make any sense. So this concept of getting a data point and, making, and, and uh, changing it over to a pixel value that is in line with the same projection is the same. The only difference is that the data that went into making these is one set of coordinates, and the data that went into making these is another set of coordinates. If you didn't have the Graticule generator, what would you use to generate these? What's, a, what's another way of getting those lines up on that map? Like brute force, not, uh, not pretty, but it would do the job. I hear a murmur, I didn't hear anything. What are these? I mean, other than the fact that they're dashed, that was just me playing around the site. Yeah. You could just draw horizontal and vertical lines in the projection of that particular exactly, exactly right. They're lines, right? They're really just lines. But you don't want to have to go through and space them out and create a loop of data. So D3 does that for you. It's pretty much just giving you a set of lines in the latitude and longitude, evenly spaced. And you feed that into the projection, which does the job of translating the data to your spherical, spherical coordinate system that is the projection. Hand kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, so for instance, the top of Montana yeah. um, is that one line with two vertices, and it's been curved by the projection. Or are you really the... testing my knowledge of where Montana is? I'm <laughs> going to claim being a Brazilian and not knowing where Montana is. Which so, line are we talking so about? The, the top line, Washington, Idaho, Montana, North Dakota, is. <laughs> <laughs> He's just making it worse. Like the northern border. Now you gotta go like, you know, the tippy point of where it does that curvy thing of where it goes. So, Just tell me where I'm getting hot or cold. So from there west, yeah. the north west, border. West, okay. Um, so you mean this? And that? The, the border of the state, it's not on the, not the gratitude. Oh, I see. Is that, um, is that just too, so the, the, the flat curve, the curve part, is that two vertices? and the curve is taken care of by the projection, or has that curve been broken up into smaller vertices um, that sort of look like the curve if you, if you break it up into other points? Does that make sense? You mean this part? No, the, to the west. This is a straight line. Yeah. So, this. short answer, it could potentially be just two points. But I actually don't know. I'm, I'm assuming... I'm guessing that it must take care of the curve to the projection because otherwise the gratitude would be really hard to do, right? Um, but that's something that you could try to like you you could find it out easily by looking at the uh, at like just picking one of the states, one of the like boring states, um, take away boring states, um, <laughs> like Montana, um, and and looking at the GeoJSON on top of that. And I'm assuming it's for coordinates or less, yeah. I'm going to give you guys pointers, the little laser pointers, this one over here. Um, okay, so is that clear what this is doing? The geographic tool is pretty much appending, is creating the data, and the path is the one that's doing the projection and giving you what the actual coordinates are. And does it necessarily do dot data? So that's a great question, that's the segue. So if you look at examples, <coughs> there is dot data and dot datum, okay? And sometimes they look like they behave the same, so you can kind of get away with using one or the other. The difference between dot data and dot datum is that dot datum does not have an exit or an enter selection. It assumes you make one selection and you're associating that one data value or that one array of data values to it. If you do a dot data on an array of values, how many SVGs is it going to assume you want to create? A little louder, someone. 
as many as the data that's already present and then the rest of the enter and exit? Right, but the, the big picture answer being as many as there are in the array. At the end of the day, if you have an array with five elements and you do a dot data, that means you want five X, rectangle, circles, whatever. If you do a dot datum, what that means is you want one element that binds that whole array to it. And that's the difference. And in this case, why are we using dot datum? How many elements is this graticule made up of? And it's tempting that when you look at all these little tiny lines, you think that they're each one. But remember when we talked about how in homework three, the area charts and the line charts would automatically update, and I was talking in homework lab, why is it that you do not have to handle enter and exit for paths when it's one path? Just gave it away. Because the generator, the generator takes care of everything. It's just one element. Yes, it, that sounds a little black box, but that's the thing. It's just one element, right? It's a pen that is drawing, and it's just connecting dots into one long line. So it's one path that has a whole bunch of little data points associated to it versus one line per segment like we did in homework one or one circle per element and so forth. That's the difference between dot data and dot data. Yep. So on the map, Alaska has like a different coordinate system. Yeah. How does how does it do that with just one projection? It's the same projection, right? It's just... There is an if statement in the projection. Oh, okay. Like, if this is Alaska, then move it to the bottom. Okay. And that really goes to show why it is that there's a different function for each different projection, because you have to handle these things differently, right? So all that logic gets taken care of behind the scenes. <coughs> okay. So we've made our base layer, our map, and now we want to add stuff on top of it. So we want to color it by major democratic party, by favorite type of ice cream, whatever. So we're going to use the same example. We're just going to add one more data file to it. So let me just show you first what it looks like, right? So this is one step cooler than what we did before. We have that same base, but on top of it, we have circles for each city, and the data for that is inside uscities.csv. So I'm going to skip this part because we just looked at it, right? So all of this is the same. You read in the states, you create your base map, right? And now we're going to actually load in the data for the cities. Now, one comment that is made here that is worth, worth noting is that drawing the base map and drawing the cities, those are completely separate activities. We are not coloring the states as a function of something. So right now, we were able to do the JSON call in one call, and then do the d3.csv completely separately. That is not always the case. If you want to color your states by a certain value, and that value is coming from another file, you need to make that call <coughs> inside the call to the map layer, right? Because the order of events is load in your map data, draw the map, color it. It can't happen outside of that order. In this case, we have circles, we have maps, we don't care what order it happens in with the one exception of we want the circles to be on top of the map, right? And can anyone tell me what defines the order of elements on the screen? The order the order the the which comes first, like yes. in the homework three, lines should be, homework two, lines should be below the circle. Exactly, just like we did with the graph, right? So you can control this by creating these groups. So this is why we have two groups here. The map layer comes first, and the city layer comes next. If you were to create these dynamically, which honestly in a perfect world is really nice as well, the less you have in your HTML, the better, you have to make sure that you create that map layer at G first before creating the cities one, otherwise your circles are behind your map and you don't understand what's going on, you did everything perfectly and you can't see anything, and then it's not cool. So that's just a side note. Okay, so, so we're, to, yeah. Go back to your question. Uh, it is actually points, so it's not a four, or in the thing, it's just a list of points. It doesn't do any curves. Um, okay, so here we're doing, you know, the very familiar at this point. You load in the data, you enter, and for each data point, you're appending a circle, and then you're uh, using that same projection that we did before to put those circles on the map, right? If we didn't use the projection and we just use a linear scale, as you can imagine, they would be completely off and not line up where they were supposed to be. We use that for the CX and the CY, and then here we are assigning the radius as a function of the population. Okay? Now, notice here, and this is a super simple example, I think we gave this before we even talked about scales, or maybe it's just easier this way. This is very similar to what you guys did way in the beginning before we had scales, right? You get the number, you multiply it by something else so that it gives you a reasonable radius. The better way of doing it, if, you have, if you're not giving a didactic example, is you have a linear scale that goes from whatever the minimum circle you want to the maximum, and you do a d3.max and min on your data. 
<coughs> go up with that. Right? So we're gonna do one more example before we move into Google Maps. Any questions so far? So it means because there are only <coughs> a limited number of circles here, it means like the CSV file had the data of only these few cities. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So like and in this case, sorry, one second. In this case, we know because you know we we created this example, but if it could be also if you had a scale that was going to zero, that means your circles would be size zero. All right. So let's suppose your scale. You accidentally did your scale to go from zero to five. And that means that the minimum data is maps to zero. And if you have a radius of zero, your circles don't show up. That would be a, a debugging comment if you saw if you thought you should have more circles. Did you have another question? Yeah. So like in the homework, list, uh, we don't have circles. We have to fill the straights, color the straights. This Thanks. Yes, so that's a, it's a little bit different. And that's our next so example. So then we have to write uh, dot stride fill attribute. Yes, exactly. But, and we're going to look at the very next example that does that. This is one example where you really want to marry the geographic information with the data that you're using to encode and make your map. Kind of like we did with the Netflix cubes, right? So here so far so good. I mean, it's all kind of the same. Um, we have the styling for the path. We have, we're selecting the SVG, getting the width and height to set these variables. Um, doing a projection just like we did before. Now here we have a color scale. There are a lot of different uh, ways of doing both color scales and scales in general. The homework calls for one called a scale band, which is also different. So whenever you guys encounter a new kind of scale, the D3 documentation is really great with examples and everything. So I won't necessarily step through what each one of them does, but um, there are more scales than you could possibly ever use. So here, we're loading in the JSON file, but then, unlike what we did before, we have to, right after that, within this call, we have to load the, in this case, agricultural data. And hopefully it's become clear, the reason is, for us to render our final product, we're coloring one as a function of the other, so we need to have both of those data uh, together. So we created our color scale up here, and now we're setting the domain with the min and the max of the data. Um, and here we're creating um, what we call a lookup. For people who use Python or other languages, it's a dictionary. It's pretty much the idea of you use a string to look up a value, right? So this is where we're going to really marry the two together. We're saying, OK, for this state, I want this value. And so we pretty much go through the state data that we just read in. And then for each one of them, we use this syntax to create a key in our data lookup dictionary and then actually give it the value as the, and we're going to use this when we're coloring our states. This brings up something that has come up a few times in the Slack channel so far, which is how do you access an object if you don't know what the string name is? Can you imagine trying to hard code every state name just in case? So this is where we really get into using variables as accessors, right? So does someone who didn't ask the question on Slack, does anyone know? other than the fact that I guess I just highlighted the answer on the screen. The, the difference of the dot notation versus this bracket notation. Because if you knew Alabama was a field, you could do data lookup dot Alabama, right? Why am I not doing a dot? Why are there brackets there? It can be someone who saw the answer too, that's fine. Yeah? Oh, yeah. It's a variable, not exactly the key value. Yes. So this, makes, this tells JavaScript to interpret the value of that variable. So in this case, we have, it's going to iterate through all the states, right? And it's going to create a key where you can later look it up by doing a dot notation, but you're not going to want to do that string by string by string, so you want to use a variable name and you use the brackets. And you use that in your homeworks, and honestly, going forward, even I'll show you, we have a Hurricane Katrina example that you, as most as possible, want to avoid hard coding strings, you make it into a variable, even if it's the one time that you're going to use it, and then call that as a variable later, because you can change it much easier. Um, Okay, so this is the cool bit where we put the two together. JSON.features is an array of all of those feature objects that we looked at before. And there's one for each, what? State, exactly. So far, the state information, the only thing that I have is a lot longer than the name of the state. But I want to associate it also with this agricultural value. So I'm going to modify that. It's really just an array of features, right? So for each one of them, I'm going to add a property. 
Remember how we were talking about how features really are just ge geometry objects that have this extra property thing? We can add anything. So here we're adding the property. In this case, we just call it value, but it could be a nice name as well. And we fill that in with the data lookup, the feature property's name. Does this make sense to everybody in this room? I'm going to rephrase that question. Does this not make sense to anybody? Does not make sense. Okay. And that's good. Someone raised their hand because I don't think that it, when you first look at it, it's very clear. Where is that coming from? Let's scroll back up real quick to our GeoJSON file. Even though it's not exactly the same one, it's similar enough. So the properties can have several properties. We're adding one right now called value. But the default property, usually when you have um, a feature, is that you have the coordinates and you have something that labels it. In this case, it's the name of the state. Okay? So we're going to use that as our lookup into the dictionary that we just created. So the mapping between the values from the CSV file and the state is done in that data lookup. Sorry, the mapping between the state name and the value of the agricultural is done in the dictionary. And then now we're joining the two of them in the properties attribute of the feature. Can you explain again the, the difference between why we didn't use dot notation and why we used the yes. square bracket? Yes. So the idea behind dot notation is you have to know what you're looking at. So if you were to say, I want to know what the average value or what the value is for Massachusetts, you would have to do data lookup dot Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. You don't oh, know. So we're using state, state row dot state. We're using a variable that has that information, but we don't have the actual string. Okay. Once you have bound your data from your CSV file, in this case, the value of the agricultural whatever, to your actual JSON features, you have everything you need in one place, which is this JSON.features. That can be your data. And then you enter and you append the path, and you give that path that has that right projection associated to it. And then you can actually use that data to color your states, like that. Cool? Yes? If I were to bind the lat launch to a feature, would I use features that Geometry dot. When we're looking at this, one. right, right, right. Yeah. So I think, but, but from what I understand, you wouldn't have to bind the Latin long to your feature because your feature comes with a Latin long. Your feature in coordinates, right? Feature mm -hmm. dot um, geometry dot coordinates is how you would access it. it has your Latin long values. Okay. It's putting it through the projection that gives you pixel values. Right? What we're doing is we're saying, okay, there's this other information that I don't originally have in my GeoJSON file that I want to associate to each state. Mm -hmm. And that's when we're doing the adding the properties.value. We could call it properties. <clears throat> my favorite color, whatever it is, um, and then give that a string. But we're incrementing our GeoJSON file to have other things that we are later we know we're going to use to encode our final visual. Okay. Yeah? Anything else? So, this, we're, we're done. We are drawing the color. We are calling the color function with the properties value. Then can you go up to the color function? Now? Yes. Like how it's working? Like we are calling a value to the color function. So you're calling a function, which it is, but it's a special kind of function, right? What is that? Scale one. It's a scale, right? And the scale pretty much maps from one thing to the other. And we're saying map from this value. Range, to these colors. Range, we, have, uh, we, have, we have specified the range, so it will map automatically depending on the input. Yes, exactly. Okay. Let me get that. So you can see that even though these New York Times maps are super stylized and they look really cool and they have all these things that you can toggle and change and shift and so forth, at the end of the day, the concept is I have the geographic information and I have other information I want to overlay on top of it, and then you can kind of go crazy. Right? But that's the, the, the idea of what we're doing, and is the idea of what you're going to be doing in homework three. Homework four, sorry. Four. Hopefully homework three is already out of the way. Um, let me see. Before I go into street maps, I'm trying to think if there's anything about the homework that I want to point out. I mean, I am going to talk about it in the labs later today. Um, 
Yeah. So hopefully all the concepts, pretty much, yeah, you, you shouldn't have, at this point, we've covered everything you need to be able to do the homework without any problems. Um, so we're going to spend... I guess for the, for, for the homework, you actually need both, right? You need this corporate approach to call it the states, um, that, or yeah. the countries that participated and to highlight the winner with the medal and um, with the medals that you need to take the reports that you did with the cities. That's a good point, yeah. So when you're thinking about the order in which you're loading in the data, the circles that are going to denote who's the winner, who's the loser, silver, or gold, and everything, that can be done separately, right? Because we, we just want to put those on top of the map. And then the map itself is going to be colored according to winner, loser, and it's been winner, uh, winner and runner-up. Winner and runner-up, yeah. There's a loser, that would be bad. <laughs> Just rub it in. Um, okay. So now we're going to talk about street maps. Um, you can do some pretty cool things with Google Maps. That being said, personally, I think Google Maps are overused. And so, you know, they have that really obvious Google Map look to it, which is fine, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so I'm going to show you how to use it, but the cool thing is not just using Google Maps, but is using Google Maps plus D3, because then you can put your visualizations on top of the map, and you don't have to worry so much if you care about zooming and panning and going to a certain location, and your visualization will move with it, which is pretty sweet. Okay? So I linked here... Uh, yeah. So here's an example of a New York Times really ugly visualization. This is the first time which uses Google Maps, right? So it's called Where the Pies Are, and it's pretty much a search for best pizza, or just pizza in general. The concept here being, we care about where the pizza is. We don't want to have a general idea that there's more pizza in this neighborhood than that one. The point of this is the geographic and the information and the ability to navigate is relevant. So you use the Google Maps back end. And in this case, they changed their marker to this beautiful icon of a pizza. Um, this is just, a, you know, to kind of reinforce when you would want to use a Google map. And then when you, I'm going to go over, honestly, this is going to be like a crash course in using the Google Maps API. They have fantastic documentation. So if you do decide, I'm going to make something and I want a Google map API, uh, I want to use a Google map, their documentation is fantastic. It's linked here. I highly recommend it. And as I'll show you, it doesn't always have to look so Google mappy. They have something called stylized maps, um, and they can look pretty cool. So... I'm not completely bashing it. Okay, so here are the steps. The first thing you need to do, and actually this, I, when I was putting the lecture together, I needed an API <coughs> key to use it. Then Alex and I were talking, and you don't always need an API key for it, so to be perfectly <coughs> honest, I don't know when you do and don't need an API key. So we're gonna figure this out after lecture, and, and we'll update the, whether or not you do need one. But if you do, you can click on this, it'll take the link on how to get one. And what the API key does is it allows you to access their API a certain number of times, so you don't just keep hitting it over and over and over and before it cuts you off. Um, so we'll just skip that step for now, even though it's embedded here. Then, what you need to make sure you do is just like when you're using D3, you need to include a script tag for it. When you're using the Google Maps API, you need to include that as a script tag. It's pretty much a library, right, that let, lets you access all of their functions. So well, I'll show you where I did that. Then you need to create a div, either programmatically or just in your SVG, for the sake of this example, we just created one, and give it an ID. The ID is important because you're gonna be passing in that ID to the API. So you can say, hey, draw me a Google map in this div. And it has to be an ID. Why can't it be a class? It's only one. Yes, there's only one ID. The idea, you can do more than one ID and it'll only pick the first one. But if you remember, remember the idea behind classes is, all of these objects can have the same class. You know, behind the idea behind the ID is only this DOM element has this, right? So you give it an ID and you pass it in, and then you call the Google Maps endpoint, create a new map inside the div. It's very, very straightforward. So I'm going to show you the super short example, and this is what you get. This uh, Google Map here. Can you hit reload? Um, yeah. He's keeping me on my toes. See if you can explain this. Just <laughs> that's a whole new slide. Um, okay, so here we're setting the height of the map to be 100%. This is just a styling thing, the blah, blah, blah. 
Um, and then here we create that div that I talked about. We gave it the ID very creatively of Mac. Don't you forget, you need to have an ID. Then, and this is a cool thing that Alex and I just did, um, we recently updated the lectures, and I don't know if you guys remember, but with the ES6, right, with the let and the const and the bars, we have this concept of where is this variable valid? Is it global, is it in this function, or is it in this block? Now, the, the way that we have these lectures set up is you have all these little snippets, right, all these little examples of code, and if I define let x equals two, that let x go, is valid throughout my entire page, unless I specifically enclose it in brackets, which is what these are. What this does is say, I only care about this variable within the context of this set, which is, in this case, this example. You wouldn't need it if this lived in its own page, because you're not conflicting with anything else. But because this is, has several HTML snippets and examples in it, it does conflict. So if you're wondering what those curly braces are, I'm sure none of you were, that's what that is. Okay, so pretty much we define a variable called map, and then this is the single call you need to make. It's a new google.maps.map, and there there's two arguments. And you know what's funny? I thought I had, oh, there it is. I should have changed the order. I should have gone through it. So, sorry, I'm going to do this first, and then I'll go back to walking through the example. This is just a spelled out what I'm going to tell you right now. This is the call that makes the new map. Okay? Straight from their documentation. So what you do is you get an element, so you pretty much select that. And then here you have an optional array of, of parameters. And I say optional, but honestly, only two of them are mandatory. The rest are optional. Right? So you start it, so the map has, I mean, this is the call, and this is the object that gets returned to so you have a map where you give it a uh, map div and the options and this is a call with the options as well. So here you have center, zoom, and this one is optional, the map type ID, which we'll play around with to see what it does. Unsurprisingly, center tells you where you want to center the map in the world, and zoom gives you the level of how much you want to zoom in. Now, the big, one of the main ideas behind this class, as you know, is you want to do everything programmatically, right? You don't want everyone to go and change it, to put the number in, change the string. So how do you change these things? So you want to change the zoom. What is a zoom of 20? What is a zoom of 1? Like, how do you really know how far in and how far out you're going to get? One, you can play around with it and see. Or two, you could, this cool little cheat sheet here that tells you what the numbers, the level of detail that you get with each number. So zoom level one is the farthest out you can get. You see the entire world. And you can go all the way down to 20, which is the satellite view of the actual buildings. And Google Maps obviously does the, the work of saying, okay, you're closer, I'm going to replace this tile now with a higher resolution one, a higher resolution one, until you get to the point where you can see the do the part and so forth. Level 20. Uh, so these are the two mandatory ones. One thing I do want to note, and honestly this is something I've only realized by going through a lot of these examples and putting together this lecture, is the way that you define this. This is a new and really short syntax. It's an object that has a lat and a long. Notice there's no O in the, in the long, it's just LNG. This is called an object literal. There's another way of defining latitude and longitudes which uh, when I get to it, I'll mention, which is a new google.map.latlong element, and it's pretty much just a long form that gives you the same thing. You can use, in 90% of, of cases, the short term. It looks nicer, it's neater, and you get away with it. If you get an error, then you can't use it and use the other one. Okay, so, oh yeah, and the last thing here is this map type ID, right? So the default map type is roadmap, so it's what we're seeing here. This is the map type road type. And then it gives you three other options, which is pretty much what you, if you were using Google Maps, you can play around with, right? You can do satellite view, a hybrid view that is both of them, and terrain. Can you do terrain type on the Google Maps if you're doing a, you can't, right? I've never done that. I guess you have to be outdoorsy to really care. Uh, so we'll play around with those to see what they look like. But now that I've explained what each one of them does, this is super, you know, straightforward, short. We create a new map and tell where the sender is. If we comment this out, we get this version of the map. And if we comment this out, we go to a cooler part of the world. <laughs> but in this example, you have two center... Oh, it overrides it, yeah. Okay. I just didn't bother commenting it out, yeah. I'm saying center is this, so never mind center is that. You get the same thing by doing that. Okay? So you have it. Your super basic Google Map API, you pretty... Um, basic map, those are the zoom levels, and you can change the types. Another thing you can do is you can set the map type or the center programmatically, right? So maybe you want to have a little button and you tell your user, there's a drop down menu. If you pick terrain, I want it to change to type terrain, you do map.set map type ID. 
obviously you don't have to remember all these things. I just wanted to show you some cool things you can do. When you're creating your own map, you're going to dive into the Google Maps API, the documentation that I've linked to. You can see all kinds of stuff that you can do programmatically. But what I really want to enforce is that you can change almost everything programmatically. You can change the pan, the zoom, all kinds of stuff. So another thing that you can do with um, Google Maps, and this is what I was talking about before, are these styled maps. This is static image. I just wanted to show you how cool it looks. I link to their tutorial, and it gives you the code on how to do it, and you can change it to night view. There's all kinds of different um, modes that you can do, and it can look pretty cool, honestly. And what I like about it, too, is it has a much less predictable kind of look and feel to it. So when I'm doing a project and I want to map, and it's kind of a... I care more about the D3 visualization that goes on top. I'll do a styled map, give it kind of a, maybe a pastel or a sketchy look, and then you really focus on the D3 visualization without having, because I feel like the satellite look is really stark, as is the, the road map, the street view, or whatever that was called, the road, no, the first one, the default one, is Google like, map. oh, we should use the Google map. So anyway, okay, so now we have our base and we want to add a D3 visualization on top of it, right? So the concept here is these ideas of overlays or layers. So the overlay, and I have here, I'm going to scroll real quick to, okay. So wait, the overlay is an object. It's a layer on top of your Google map where you can add a whole bunch of stuff. When you see Google Maps, you often see those red markers, the really ugly ones. I'm really coming down hard on Google Maps. I should stop that. You know, the markers, the usual ones. Those get put on the marker layer. This overlay has several different, just think of it as, as different types of things get put on different layers. You can have uh, float pane, which is pretty much for information windows. You, can, you have the map pane, which is where you have the actual tiles on marker layers, where you have those very quintessential Google type markers. The overlay layer, which is what we're going to focus on, because this is the one that takes polylines, polygons, and we can draw on it, so where our D3 visualization is going to live. And you can actually choose between overlay layer and overlay mouse target. I didn't really know about overlay mouse target until I was putting together this lecture, which is the same thing as overlay layer, but it accepts mouse elements, um, DOM elements. So if you want your D3 visualization that lives on top of your map to be interactive, and you can click and hover and get stuff, then all it means is the target, and I'll show you where we define that, is that the overlay layer is going to be overlay mouse target. That's just a distinction that's worth making if you don't understand why your D3 code that was generating beautifully responsive maps when it was standalone on top of the D3 map was doing, on the Google map was doing nothing. Okay? So those are different, uh, the d different layers. Overlay view has these methods, and we're going to be using, and the yellow lines I just put next to the ones that are relevant for our tutorials. So I just kind of highlighted them in case, but you, obviously all of these are valid. So you need to implement a draw method, and that, what that pretty much says is, once I have the map up and running, what do you want me to draw on this? So the bulk of our code really goes into our draw method. Get panes is pretty much the function that tells you, that gets all those layers that we specify which one we're actually going to be plotting on, whether it's overlay or, or overlay mouse target. Get projection, which is what we're going to use. I'll show you all in the example. On add, um, this initializes the DOM elements on top of the map and set map, which is where we associate this new layer to that basic map that we created in that first example. And then these are the layers. And then your projection will actually do the conversion from lat long to the pixel. So this is the equivalent. This from lat long to div pixel is the equivalent of what function that we just used in our D3 example? You can't answer. You can't answer too much. Projection. Projection. Exactly, right? It's, it's, it's Google Maps doing what we were doing not by hand, what D3 was doing for us before. Okay, so why don't we step through this example, and, uh, and the write-up pretty much explains what I'm going to tell you here. So this is just like that first base level map, you know, you're creating a new map. Um, and one thing I do want to point out here is, I think, oh, you know what, I think I didn't mention this. Let me mention this here, because I think this is where I have the write-up for it. Yes. Notice how... So as you might expect, the documentation for the Google Maps doesn't know or care about D3. And one thing that it takes as an argument is that div where you want your map to live. Now, once you've been using D3 for long enough, if someone says you need to select a div, the first thing you think of is D3.select and you put your ID. 
but that's not something you have access to if you're just using Google Maps API. So this is where we revert back to the native API that Alex talked about way back when, where you do a document get element by ID and you give it the map, right? This does the same thing. There is one difference though. You can't just replace, let's suppose you're using D3 and you don't want this long form way of saying document get ID. So you want to use instead, and I'm going to replace this, d3.select map. We call it map, right? Yeah. And you'll see that that doesn't render anything. And the reason it, for that is you need to do that. That still doesn't render anything. No, it does. It does. I tested it. So notice that in order to use D3, there's two things I had to do. One is I had to obviously uncomment the import of the D3 library, which I did make a note to myself and then didn't do it. And the other thing is, it's a D3 dot and I want to just explain this dot node really quickly. When you do a D3 select on something, what you end up with is a D3 selection, right? And there's all these concepts associated to a D3 selection, enters and update, and you can do all kinds of stuff. When you do a document get element by ID, it doesn't give you a D3 selection. It gives you a native API DOM node, which is that ID. For us to go from the D3 selection to the node, you do a dot node. It pretty much just takes that one extra step to go back to nothing but pure DOM node. Okay, that's why we need that DOM node, that, uh, dot node there. And we didn't use it before when we were using the native API because we were also using all of the native API attribute calls. We weren't mixing the two. So that's just in case you wanted to use D3. Okay. Just a sidebar. <coughs> okay, so first I'm going to show you the final example and then I'll step through it because I think it's pretty cool. So this was, and I think, yeah. So this is hurricane data, that, and I'll show you the website that we got it from in just a bit. So this is, it get, for every we have a, for every line in our data, we have a latitude, a longitude, a timestamp, the name of the hurricane, the wind speed, and a bunch of other data. And so we thought, okay, let's look at this, where we encode the strength of the hurricane of the wind by two things, the color and the size of the circle. So you can kind of see it getting stronger and then getting weaker. And then we also said, okay, we only want to look at Katrina. So we filter it out, and I'll show you in the code. So we only color the Katrina values. Everything else is gray. Just kind of an idea of what do hurricane paths and strengths look like in the North Atlantic, and then the Katrina. And this is where, this is a tool that's based on that data, this is where we got the data from, and you can actually search here. So we were looking at this data. It's not intuitive that when you're done with the search, you have to click the search thing again. Um, that's funny that we do. It's loading. Oh, it's loading, right. So that is the track. And then you can actually see, so let me zoom out a little bit, right? So it's the same data. We, we did the same thing, but a slightly simpler version because we don't have the connecting dots just yet, the connecting paths. But no, not that one. this is all of the hurricanes in the area, if you zoom out in the entire world. All the hurricanes ever? Or I don't know how far back it goes, actually. Probably not ever, right? Well, I mean, like, they're, they're data, right? You know what? I think that if we do by... I wonder if you start typing 1946? 18? No. Looks like 60-something. No, there's 1947. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah, a long time. Um, so this is like a cool, like obviously much more polished version than our example here, but you get that same data and then you do all kinds of stuff with it, and it's pretty cool. So a lot of these um, like infographic-y kind of things where they have the hurricane path and then they show the cone of influence, I'm sure that's not what it's called, this area around it where it actually 
has an influence. Um, so, and you'll see it's a pretty straightforward example, but it really exemplifies, I say example, one more way. It really shows you how you can join a pretty boring Google map with some pretty cool data. So let's see how that's done, and then we'll wrap up. Um, okay, so this is basically creating that base Google map, right? Then we downloaded the, the whole data, and which has Katrina as one of the se uh, several of one of the hurricanes. We'll call it Katrina.csv. So now we're creating that overview layer where we're going to put our D3 visualization in. Okay. So one of the first things that we need to do is when this on add means when the map is ready, when the map has been added, what do you want to do? And so this is where we're going to pretty much draw our visualization. Okay. So this, if you recall, the get panes function, which I breezed through, is the one that says, give me all those different layers. Marker layer, overlay layer, overlay mouse event. You have all these different types. And of all of those, give me this one, this overlay layer. So it's pretty much specifying where it is, where on this hierarchy of layers we're going to append our div. So we're going to append a div called hurricane, or giving it a class of hurricane. So you, you've pretty much added the layer. Then we have the draw function, which we were saying is where we're actually going to make our D3 visualization. Okay? This is where we go and get the projection that Google Maps has established. So this is pretty much the one where we're gonna, we need that projection to be able to convert our latitude and longitude to pixel values. So this is equivalent to what we were doing before, where we had a projection attribute and you fed it in lat long and it gave you pixel values. What is this? So this is the overlay, oh, okay. yeah, because yeah, it's a, it, what we're doing is we're setting a function of the overlay object, so this <coughs> refers to the object that has that function. And the above one, that this refers to? So this also is the same concept, right? This overlay.onAd and overlay.draw, they're still both referring to overlay. Okay? It's, a, it's a class. So here's what we were saying before. We could change it if we wanted to call it something else. We said, let's look at Katrina. So we put that in a variable. And then this is because it was just so noisy with all the data. So you know, let's just filter it out and only leave the hurricanes that happen in the North Atlantic. And notice that there's this space here. That is not a typo. The data had this space. And so for the longest time, I was filtering by NA and coming up empty. And I was like, this is the stupidest thing until you realize that it's a space. So now that works. So don't take that space out. Um, this is me just renaming it because I thought when, if you put, um, the, I thought it was an ugly name, so I renamed it to wind. Honestly, there's no, nothing to be learned from this line, so we can skip that. Then here, this, I sorted it so that, because if you don't sort it, there are all these overlaying, overlapping circles, right? Which means that some of the Katrina ones could be behind some of the gray ones, and I want all the gray ones on the bottom. So I said sort it, and then the callback says, put on, only return as a yes, anything that has a name of Katrina. And yeses go on top of those. So it just means it put all the Katrina stuff at the top of my file without me having to go back to the CSV file and actually make it to any changes, which we really don't want to do. So here we created a color scale. Um, and I actually got this from, because I was creating colors and I thought they all looked ugly. So apparently there is somewhere, a very reliable source, a, like a dictionary that says if the wind's up to this speed, this color, that speed, that color. So the, I got it from and I, I linked it here. So if it's up to 35, it's this color, up to 73 and so forth. Okay? So the fact that you have as many elements in your domain as you have in your range pretty much just maps them. And if you're anywhere between 35 and 73, you get mapped to this one and so forth and so on. I also create a linear scale for the wind. So you're very, at this point, super familiar with you guys. Go through the data, min and max, that's the domain. And I decided I want my circles to go from 2 to 10. And that was a reasonable kind of how big and how small I wanted them. If you accidentally do 0 to 10, because you, then you're going to have these circles that don't show up. Okay? We're selecting our SVG, and we're associating to it the data that we just read in. And then this is pretty much going through each one of them and applying this transform. And this is where we're actually moving it. Now, this is a slightly different way of doing it than we've done before. You could also do it as an attribute that uses the data. But the concept here is, for each one of our data points, applying this transform function. And what it does is it uses the projection to return a pixel value. Now this is what I was saying before in terms of there are some times that this is a different way of pretty much creating that object literal. Um, I tried replacing this with the object literal and it didn't work. 
And I actually looked it up and it said that there are a few, and I can't tell you exactly what the rules are, um, for the most part you can just use an object. The curly brace is as long as this, long as this, and you're done. And in this case, maybe because it goes into projection, I'm not entirely sure, you actually have to create a Google map latitude longitude object. Right? It's a, it's a, it's re and you pass it in the latitude and longitude. Anyway, so this, you pass into the projection, and then these, this D has an X and Y, which is a pixel value, which is what you care about, which is where you're going to move your circles. And so you pretty much just do the D3 styling there. Okay? Um, you give it the class of marker, and then for each one of these, you append the circle, where the radius is defined by the wind scale. The CX and the CY are the padding. Now, notice that CX and CY are padding because we've actually moved them to the right location inside the transform function. The padding just means move them over just a little bit by X or by Y, or by what we define as the padding. And then this is where we color them, right? So just like we had colored our states by the value of the agricultural thing, here we're filling it, giving if the name of the hurricane is whatever we defined, so in this case Katrina, return color scale for the wind value. Otherwise, return this light gray. Okay, so this is a ternary operator, which is a ES6, I think, right? Is it only ES6? No, it's from before. Which is something that we, we've talked about briefly, and it's a nice shorthand and avoids more if statements, right? It's pretty much saying, in this case, I want this, otherwise I do that. So it can get, honestly, you could, these can get really nested and complicated because inside your if not, you can actually put parentheses and make a whole nother if ternary statement within a ternary statement and get pretty ugly. And there are a lot of people who are strongly against that. Um, but for short things like this, I think it's very readable and I really like using it. And then I just made them 0.8 because there was so much overlap that I wanted to kind of see through them. And that's what we get. So that, with five minutes to spare, is our Mac lecture. Um, um, this yeah. Example, um, the, the, like scale, uh, in the color function we use scale linear, we could use scale part and as part time in the lab. Also, wait, 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 say that again, the color scale what? Uh, the color function, we use a scale, scale linear, yeah, but we could use the scale part time as in the Yes, example. it's a different scale, just keep, yeah, absolutely. You could. Um, any questions? Yes. Can you explain what padding is again? Yeah, so it's just honestly, these are is one of the ways of styling it. Um, Where is padding? Padding is defined. Um, below, below. Over there. Over It's just a way of making sure that you move all of them over by this amount, x and y. Um, if you, yeah, it's it's really just a styling thing. You could also have added that in when you're defining your. Dx and dy. But then the circle cx and cy have the fixed value of padding. So the x and y axis. No, because you you take it out here in the transform. Cx and cy are always yes. Those are always, but you've transformed. So there are two ways you can move things. Do you remember when we were? I have no idea what homework number this is anymore. CX and CY will tell you where to move something, right? It's like giving an X and Y for circles. You can also set CX and CY to zero and then transform your circle, right? I mean, the transform yeah, yeah. translates it. So there are just two ways of accomplishing the same thing. Yeah, Usually we transform a group that has everything in it, mm -hmm. and if you're only doing circles, CX and CY. So we are transforming there. In this case, we're transforming the circles. CX and CY are set to this tiny little number. Okay, homework lab today at 6. We're going to go over homework 4. Um, and yep, that's it. Thanks.